Well, it is wonderful to be with you all this morning. My name is John Werner. I'm the minister to men here at Portland Community Church. And uh, we're going to talk about an epiphany. Hopefully we'll have one. Uh, if not today, shortly thereafter. Um, Ron was mentioning that he had a little bit of snow on the ground up where uh, he is. Um, there's no snow on the ground at my house, just a lot, of, uh, a lot of wet, and probably most of you have been experiencing an awful lot of that wet this year. Um, seems like we've had a really, really wet uh, winter so far. Uh, but I guess we're kind of making up for the dry summer and the uh, really mild winter that we had last year. But the positive side of that, the flip side of all the wet, is the mountains. For those of you who ski, uh, and I haven't been up there this year, but it is, uh, I understand, absolutely glorious. Tons and tons of snow, great for, uh, uh, for that kind of recreation. Um, when I first learned skiing, my family and I all decided we were going to learn it, learn it together. Uh, we happened to live in Denver, Colorado at the time, so we, uh, we actually took our Christmas vacation to Aspen, and we got lessons. I have three kids, and uh, the kids had their lessons, and Beth and I had our lessons with the adults. Now, um, my oldest, my firstborn, Andy, uh, was seven years old at the time, and if you... Uh, know anything about kids, you know they're all elbows and knees and uh, their coordination really hasn't developed yet. Uh, I was very much into sports when I was growing up in school, so I mean I played a lot of basketball, a lot of tennis, and I remember pulling my son aside before we actually started our lessons. And I said, uh, now Andy, um, this is going to be a little bit tricky and a little difficult. You haven't done this before. Of course, I hadn't either. And I said, but I want to tell you something. I really believe this. I really didn't, but I was telling him this to encourage him. Within two or three years, I bet you're going to be better than I am at this skiing thing. So we took off for our lessons. And we had our lessons. Beth and I were very rudimentary, and we were off uh, within a couple of hours on our own. And I remember halfway through the afternoon, skiing down the slopes and thinking, hey, I've got this down. This is pretty fun. And out of nowhere, zips this little rocket, no bigger than a New York minute. It was Andy, just blowing past me. And I'm sitting here, have you ever had one of these aha moments where it's like, wow, who'd have thought? I never realized. My kid was not only better than me in two or three years, not even not only better than me at the end of a day, he was better than me halfway through the day. Um, it was a real comeuppance. It was an epiphany. Uh, now, we all have these epiphanies from time to time. Um, and the word epiphany according to Merriam-Webster, is a moment in which one suddenly sees or understands something in a new or very clear way. The word epiphany actually comes from the Greek, and it means to reveal. So it's like a sudden revelation. It's one of those aha moments. Now, I have to tell you that the word epiphany is not found in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be talking from the Gospel of Matthew this morning. In fact, the word epiphany is not found anywhere in the Bible. But the Bible is all about epiphany. It's all about revelation uh, and uncovering and giving us the ability to discover, uh, sometimes very unexpectedly, uh, what the story is about. Um, the uh, other definition of epiphany is a Christian festival held on January 6th in honor of the coming of the Magi to the infant Jesus. Now, um, newborns, it's amazing to see the epiphany in their eyes. I've got a two-week-old grandson. My daughter had him over for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And the wonderment at everything that happens is an epiphany. And you can just see it in their eyes. They're like, wow, that was cool. Do that again. How did that happen? And you can just see this, this awareness just hitting them. I mean, it bursts all the time. Um, Grown-ups and younger, not so much. It seems as we get older, uh, we, we know it all. It's all in our heads. We know too much, so we can't have any epiphanies. So, uh, we can't uh, really have those aha moments as much as we, uh, we would like to or as much as we used to. Um, but one of the things that I hope we can unpack this morning is that epiphany is not a matter of what's in your head. It's really driven by what's in your heart, the attitude. Um, and we want to discover uh, that with attitude comes epiphany. 
Uh, let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray uh, that we would all gain a revelation this morning from your word and that we would discover anew just what it means to have a relationship with you through your son Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. So we are going to be reading from Matthew chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 12. And um, before I uh, go through the actual reading of it, I want to talk to you about the characters in a story. And this is a great story. But every great story, every novel, has got some very basic and fundamental characters. The first character that you would expect to see is the antagonist or a villain. Uh, second character that appears in most good novels and stories is what's called a dynamic character. This is a character who changes through the course of events that are taking place in that story. The third character would be a static character. That's a character who doesn't change. No matter what kind of circumstances or events are going on around them, they don't change. Doesn't matter how much they know, how little they know. And then the third character is the protagonist. Now, in this story that we're going to be looking at this morning, the antagonist, the bad guy, is King Herod. The uh, dynamic characters are the magi, or some of your translations read the wise men. Uh, and the third character would be um, the priests and scribes. They are extremely knowledgeable. They know more than I will ever know, but they don't change. They're kind of stuck. Uh, and then the protagonist, of course, is Jesus. Now, Jesus really has a very small appearance in this, uh, almost no appearance in this uh, story this morning, uh, but he is the central character throughout the story. Uh, let, me, uh, let me read these first 12 verses. Oh, and we are talking about... Uh, Actually, I don't want to get ahead of myself here before we read the first 12 verses. King Herod, we're going to give some historical background and then we'll read the, uh, uh, what the text says. Now, Herod was actually born in southern Israel uh, or uh, the Judea. He was born specifically in an area of Judea, a province called Edomia. Now, Edomia is a modern version 2,000 years ago modern, version of what were previously the Edomites. Now, this is important, uh, and just bear with me for a second, but this is important that we, uh, we get a little bit of background on the Edomites so we can set up just who Herod was and who Herod is to this story. Herod is an Edomite, not just because he's from the province of Edomia, but because of his heritage. Way back, 2,000 years before Herod was born, Abraham gave birth to two sons. One was an illegitimate son, Ishmael. The other was his legitimate son by his wife, Isaac. And then Isaac, in turn, uh, gave birth to two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the first born. They were twins. Esau was the first one born, and Esau had red hair, flaming red hair. I used to have red hair when I was a kid, and uh, people who just met me and couldn't remember my name would call me Red sometimes lefty, because that was true too, but uh, uh, for whatever reason, they couldn't remember John, so they would just call me Red. Esau was nicknamed Red. And in the ancient text, the word Red is Edom. And Esau, or Edom, became the father of the Edomites. Now his brother, uh, Jacob, became renamed as Israel, uh, and he became the father of the 12 tribes or 12 nations of Israel. Uh, had 12 sons, and that became the people of Israel. So you've got Edom or Esau over here. You've got Jacob and the nation uh, of Israel over here. And Edom or Esau was basically swindled out of his birthright and his inheritance as the firstborn, which was due to him by his brother Jacob. So right or wrong, Jacob took the place of Esau. And Esau, throughout history has been absolutely incensed about it. Jealous of the Israelites, angry at the Israelites, thinking they don't deserve it, and thinking that we want to get it back. Um, so you've got, today on that map, Edomia uh, and the Edomites basically were assimilated into and absorbed by the Philistines. Now, almost finished here, so just bear with me for just a half a minute more. Philistia which was a thorn in the side of the Israelites, 
uh, back in history, and you read that in the Old Testament all the time, Philistia, around the time of Jesus, around the time of Christ, was renamed in Latin Palestina, or what we have today as the Palestinians. And the West Bank is still where the Palestinians hang out. They're kind of squatters, just like the Philistines were, wanting a bigger part of Israel and still very much at enmity with the Israelites. So this is uh, who Herod was. And by the way, the uh, uh, distance between Jerusalem and Bethlehem is just five miles, very close. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So quick timeline on the life and times of King Herod. He was born around 74 B.C., um, and uh, when he was just 27 or 28 years old, his father, who was a Roman official, appointed him governor of the province of Galilee up north. So he moved from where he lived down in Edomia up north and became the governor of uh, uh, the Galilean province. And then uh, in 41 BC, there was a civil war, actually more of a palace coup. Uh, some... Uh, uh, some folks overthrew the existing government and Herod uh, was just totally at odds with this because he was no longer uh, in favor and so he fled to Rome. He ran off to Rome. He appealed to the, uh, to the uh, Roman, uh, Holy Roman Empire, uh, to Caesar, and said, hey, I need some help down there. We need help in Israel uh, making things right and putting Rome firmly back in place. And Rome agreed. So they sent uh, him down with the authority and with some troops to uh, make things happen. And in 37 BC, Herod, along with the Roman troops, recaptured Jerusalem. Now, fast forward to 6 BC, Jesus is born. Now I know we like to think of Jesus as being born in 0 AD uh, because we have BC is before Christ and AD is uh, Anno Domini or uh, the year of our Lord. Um, but uh, somewhere around the 5th century, one of the popes, adjusted the Julian calendar and that's uh, what sort of uh, threw these things the way they are. So Jesus actually, according to our current calendar, was born in 6 BC. The Magi showed up somewhere between 5 and 4 BC. And then in 4 BC, uh, Herod dies. So um, very interesting, when Herod went to Rome to appeal to Caesar for some help, the Romans were so enthralled with this guy because he was so committed to the empire that they named him King of the Jews. Imagine that. Herod. Herod the Great. Herod the First. He is the King of the Jews as far as Rome's concerned and by the way as far as Herod's concerned. So Herod takes possession of all of this power and authority. He now rule, rules Palestine uh, and he rules pretty brutally. Anybody who doesn't agree with him he just has them whacked. He has him killed. Uh, he eventually uh, killed one of his uh, up to ten wives, uh, kills at least two if not three of his sons, uh, any number of um, uh, priests, uh, you know, Jewish priests, uh, he has killed just because they represent a threat to his authority and his control. So he rules very, very ruthlessly. The big thing in Herod's favor is he is a tremendous builder. Not personally getting into the dirty hands end of things, but he built the, uh, the great Jewish temple, rebuilt Solomon's temple. He rebuilt a, uh, or built from scratch a uh, huge port in Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, built all kinds of uh, uh, athletic facilities, um, uh, large venues, many other places of worship for other gods, not just Jewish gods. But in all of this, Herod, with his background, his lineage as being Arab on both sides of his family, and being from Esau's uh, uh, line of descent, lays claim to being Jewish. And he does think somewhat from a Jewish perspective. So he works very well with the Jewish mindset. But that's who, uh, who Herod is. And again, he is the uh, king of the Jews. All of this takes place at the very end of Herod's life. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where we're going to be reading right now in um, Matthew. So... Uh, let me ask you, if you would, just in honor and out of respect for God's word, to stand with me, and I'm going to read uh, just the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. 
Now, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Well, then Herod secretly called for wise men, for the wise men, and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I also may pay him homage. And when they'd heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that, had, that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star, star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream... Not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. You may be seated. Um, Herod truly was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, he was an Edomite, an Arab, if you will, dressed in a Jewish toga. And he tried to appeal to his people that way. Um, the uh, question that we want to ask ourselves is how do the characters in our story that we talked about react to the child who has been born? Um, we've got several things going on here. The first is they're asking. And in this case, it's the Magi who are asking. Um, this is uh, sort of interesting. Uh, talk about an epiphany. Um, we've got uh, men who are lost actually asking directions. <laughs> um, second thing going on here is uh, these wise men are seeking Jesus. They're seeking. They're inquiring. They know a lot. The wise men are extremely intelligent men. And by the way, uh, your translations may read differently. I'm reading from a translation that some of you may not have. Uh, and that's not as important as, um, you know, what's behind the words. Some of your translations read wise men. Some of them read magi. But the truth of the matter is, these wise men were astrologers. Not astronomers, astrologers. Uh, kind of like today we have astrologers who read your horoscope. So these are some guys who are into some stuff that, as people of faith, we may not subscribe to. Uh, but in their defense, they were men of integrity who saw a star that they didn't recognize, and they were following that star. Now, a word on the star. Um, historians uh, really cannot identify uh, back at the time of Christ's birth any astronomical events that took place that could have created a star that these guys would have followed. Now, this is just my opinion, although I have read some other folks who hold to this opinion as well. But I believe what these uh, magi, these wise men were seeing, was a pillar of fire, the same pillar of fire that guided the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years. And this was an unexplained phenomenon to them, and they saw this, and they followed it, and then somewhere uh, over Jerusalem, the star's light went out. And that's when they inquired of the uh, ruler of the Israelite people, uh, gee, hey, what's going on? Tell us about the, uh, the Messiah, the, the king who's been born. We want to find him. Um, so we've got that going on. The, uh, the third thing that we see in here uh, is homage. That word appears three times in these 12 short verses. Homage is respect, it's worship, uh, it's reverence. And the fourth thing that we see is frightened. Who's frightened? Well, Herod's frightened. Why is he frightened? Herod's frightened because the king of the Jews, who is this who has been born king of the Jews? That's a threat to Herod's rule, to Herod's control. Um, Herod doesn't want to have any competing king in there, so he is going to uh, do what he can to eliminate that threat. 
Now, why would the people be threatened? And it does say that they are. Uh, it says, um, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. Well, a different Messiah could only mean more persecution, or perhaps a different form of persecution. Now, Herod's rule was uh, pretty much of an iron fist. Uh, he exacted very, very heavy taxes on the people of Israel. He had to, to pay for all these grand building projects that he had going on. But beyond that, he also had people uh, killed. He had a secret police force, uh, like we hear of in uh, uh, places like Russia and Iran. Um, Herod ruled very tyrannically, but the people knew who he was. They knew who they were dealing with. And to introduce a new Messiah, a new king of the Jews, could only upset the apple cart once they'd, and now that they'd already figured out how to deal with Herod, uh, how to live under his rule. So the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, were also frightened when they heard this news that there was a, uh, a new and a different king of the Jews out there somewhere. Um, so the interesting thing, I think, about uh, God choosing to... Uh, include this story in Matthew's gospel to record this piece of history is that in using astrologers, the magi, the wise men, it really shows us that God reaches out to all people, not just to Jews, not just to Gentiles. He reaches out to all kinds of sorts of folks, people who we wouldn't necessarily relate to or identify with, uh, but God can speak to anybody and God can give an epiphany to anybody if their attitude is right. Um, with attitude comes epiphany. Now, we've got um, in our country a lot of things that are changing. Our government's controlling things uh, that uh, are, are getting taken out of our own hands. Um, most of you can't remember this, but when I was a kid in school, and this is not a, kid of, this is not a picture of me, but it could have been, um, uh, we actually had school prayer. Uh, and it was all the way up until 1962 that school prayer was commonly practiced throughout public schools in the United States. I remember twice a week, every week, a different one of us kids in our class would get up and the teacher would let us read a psalm from the Bible in front of the rest of the class. In 1962, the federal courts ruled, not nah, can't do that, uh, that's out of bounds. And since then, uh, for people of faith, um, the separation of church and state has become more and more uh, prevalent. Uh, today, we no longer allow to ce celebrate Christmas or say Merry Christmas. Uh, of course, most of you do, but uh, our stores say Happy Holidays. We have a holiday tree. Uh, we're not allowed to have a Christmas tree. Um, it's very unfortunate. Just this summer, um, there was no halftime uh, for the Friday Night Lights at Brandon High School. The marching band had been benched. The band was ordered off the field because the Christian hymn, How Great Thou Art, was a part of their halftime show in violation of a federal court order. So word about the band getting benched spread across town quicker than my boy skis downhill. Um, it's an example of how our government is pushing God out of society and out of our culture. It's the same thing that was happening at the time of Herod and at the time of Jesus. The government was controlling everything uh, and trying to control everything. Now, I want to read the next few verses here, Matthew 5 through 8, chapter 2, 5 through 8, and it says, they told him, now this is, the they is the chief priests and the scribes. These are guys very smart, very smart. Um, they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd, that is, to rule my people Israel. Well, then Herod secretly called for the wise men, the magi, and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. Now, what do the religious leaders know? And more importantly, what do they do? Well, we know because they know everything about the Bible. A scribe, by the way, is a copyist, somebody who copies word for word what's in the Bible. Uh, so these folks really knew what the Bible was all about. The Old Testament, uh, 
uh, our Old Testament, but to, the, to them it was the, uh, the Bible. Uh, their answer to, to um, King Herod was without a moment's hesitation. The Messiah comes from Bethlehem. That's where the Messiah will be born. So what did they do? What action did they take? Well, apparently, nothing. We've got, uh, we've got people who are asking, people seeking, people paying homage. We've got people who are frightened. All of them are reactions that we can understand. But we've got the scribes and the chief priests who are actually indifferent. There is no record in this narrative, this historical narrative, that the scribes and the chief priests went with the Magi, with the wise men, to Bethlehem. I mean, now, if you have some wise men coming and saying, hey, we heard about this Messiah, about this king of the Jews who's been born, who has been born, not who will be born. They say, who has been born. You would think, wow, sweet, no kidding, let's go. We're going to join you. Again, Jerusalem is how close? Five miles, maybe five and a half. We're talking a couple hours by foot. And the chief priests and the scribes should have been all over that. No record at all that they had any interest whatsoever. They know everything up here, but the attitude's not right in their heart. Um, with attitude comes epiphany. There was no great revelation to the scribes and to the chief priests. Um, for us, this is a little bit of an aside. For us, Jesus is a spiritual reality. Our relationship is a spiritual one. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was a physical reality. He actually came into earth. Now, it's harder to be indifferent, indifferent like the scribes and Pharisees were when you've got a physical reality right there with you. What's remarkable is that the chief priests and the scribes totally discounted this revelation because it didn't conform with their ability to control the people. And the chief priests and the scribes did have tremendous control over the general population. Subordinate to Herod, but very much in control in their own way. With attitude comes epiphany. Now, uh, Matthew 2, the last three verses, let me just uh, read through that. Uh, it says, when they, and again, that's the magi, the wise men, heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising. So apparently the star has appeared again. Whether it's a pillar of fire, I don't know, but that's what my sense is. Until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now, why, let me go back there for a second, why don't the wise men share their discovery? Well, the reason they don't share, share, share their discovery is because they had an epiphany. They had a dream. They had an attitude of worship, of homage, of reverence to this new baby, this new king of the Jews that was just absolutely unparalleled. Herod didn't have it. The chief priests and the scribes didn't have it. The wise men, the magi, the astrologers were absolutely blown away. It says with joy. Um, and God blessed them with an epiphany. He gave them a dream saying, hey, you don't go, want to go back to see Herod because Herod means no well for this new king, Jesus, my son, and he means no well for you. Uh, it will not go well for you. So um, the rulers and the uh, priests and the magi, the rulers were hostile. In this case, Herod. And in also in this case, uh, our own political leadership. Many of our leaders are actually hostile towards uh, our faith, towards um, the worship of Jesus. Uh, other rulers are frightened. Herod was frightened. He was both hostile and frightened. Um, that can be the case today too. This is not unique to 2,000 years ago. It is absolutely a direct overlay on what happens in our culture today uh, in the 21st century. The priests, sadly, they were indifferent. I think they're the most tragic of all the characters in this story. They were apathetic, if you will. They did not apply their incredible storehouse of knowledge to their current world. 
They weren't looking for a Messiah. They wanted to stay in control, and a Messiah meant uh, upsetting their ability to control the people. The Magi, they were seeking Jesus. They were worshiping Jesus when they found him, and they did find him. Um, with, uh, oh, and the verses that I really would love for us to focus on, they were overwhelmed with joy. Uh, what a great, uh, great response. Uh, what a great emotion. Uh, it's a great emotion of uh, Christmas, joy to the world. Uh, on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And these gifts that they gave, this is where we get uh, our Christmas tradition of sharing gifts, giving gifts to those that we love, that are important to us, people that we honor, that we respect. Um, we share gifts with and we give gifts to them. Uh, this is why the wise men didn't share their discoveries because of their epiphany. They shared with Jesus, but not with King Herod. Um, now, Brandon High School. Uh, back to Brandon High School. If we can see if we can get this to advance here. There we go. Um, something had to be done to set this wrong, make, uh, done to right this wrong, the people said. A message had to be sent. Uh, and what they did really became known as the musical shot heard round the world. During halftime of the next Friday or that Friday night's game, a lone voice stood up and began to sing the forbidden song. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. The crowd just sat there. And then one by one, people started to stand. At first it started out as a hum, but the sound got louder and louder. What an incredible moment to watch hundreds of people singing together in the stadium. It must have been a sight. Hundreds and hundreds of people standing together and with one voice sending a message to a legal system in our American system of government that dared to silence the very voice of God. How do you respond to this news of this child born king? We've got rulers who are hostile, who are frightened. Is that your response to God's word, to the revelation that you discover in God's word? We've got priests who are indifferent. Many of you know a lot more about the Bible than I do. What do you do with it? You're doing with it. And you've got wise men who are seeking and worshiping. Um, who seeks and who worships this new baby Jesus? Your attitude can cause an epiphany. These wise men were overwhelmed with joy. Uh, and joy is the operative word, especially now at this Christmas season. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold... I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Merry Christmas and happy Epiphany. Let me close this with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this word from the Gospel of Matthew. And we thank you not just that Jesus was born, but Lord, that you desire to give each one of us an epiphany. But Lord, too often our minds get in the way. We think that we have learned it all and that there's nothing new that we can be taught. And Father, I pray that you'd give each one of us a softer heart, an attitude that looks for you that looks for your epiphany. And Lord, I know that you long to give each of us an epiphany, and I pray that you would do that for each one of us this morning here uh, in this body of worship. We thank you so much for this, Lord, and we pray these things in the name of your Son, the most wonderful gift of all, Jesus Christ. Amen. Say, in your, uh, your bulletins, uh, before the uh, ushers come forward and receive the offering in a couple minutes,